As a three-day war extends to a year and a half, can Putin's economy continue to power his war machine? Welcome to the Silicon Curtain podcast. If you enjoy the materials we create and enjoy the tremendous guests we feature, then please do like and subscribe and share a link to the channel with your friends. Also, do consider becoming a patron to support the work that we do. Timothy Ash has been a professional economist for more than 30 years, with two thirds of that in the banking industry. Timothy's specialism is emerging European economies, and he writes and blogs extensively on the economic challenges for leading publications such as the Kiev Post, Atlantic Council, Financial Times, and the United Business Journal. He is also an associate fellow in the Russia and Eurasian program at Chatham House and has advised various governments on Ukraine-Russia policy and specifically on the impact of sanctions. And Tim, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you back for the third time to the channel. My pleasure. And it comes at an absolutely critical week. We see Russia pulling out of the Black Sea grain deal. We see it attacking Odessa. Now, They've said that that is in retaliation for the Kerch Bridge. I think most commentators think that is nonsense. You know, they cannot line up that scale of attack in sort of 24, 48 hours. It's quite likely that they had decided to hit Odessa and been planning for that for a number of weeks, meaning that pulling out of the grain deal is a strategic move on their part. What is your take on this hot topic? I think there's a few factors coming together. Um, possibly number one in my mind is, is the Wagner um, uh, coup attempt um, or mutiny, uh, whichever way you want to put it. I mean, I think that showed Putin to be incredibly weak. The fact that, you know, Prigozhin's forces could have taken, probably could have taken Moscow in a few hours, which was quite extraordinary. And I think it showed Putin's weakness. And I think this is maybe a way for him to, you know, reset the agenda signal to outside forces that he's still a player he's still got some leverage and you know it's, it's about taking leverage now uh, uh, admittedly there had been a lot of talk about the grain deal being ended uh, this time around um, but I think maybe the Wagner the Wagner mutiny kind of concentrated minds in Moscow and uh, you know suddenly Putin is again on the in the international headlines you know with as a guy who, you know, people need to talk to, right? And, you know, whereas I guess post Prigozhin affair, he was seen as, you know, the question marks were whether he could sustain in office. And there is still debate about how Putin actually survived that. We saw the army, we saw the Siloviki basically standing aside to see who would emerge victorious. We don't know what would have happened in Moscow, but it would have been kind of interesting nonetheless. Um, there are rumours that Putin has simply paid Prigozhin off, made a deal, paid him off. And if that is true, that really, really emphasises both the sort of bankrupt nature of his regime and its uh, basis of power and, of course, his tremendous weakness. I mean, it feels like the historical case, doesn't it, of, you know, paying the Vikings to go away and leave us alone. It's a it's an extraordinary short term, weak strategy. Yeah, Dane gold, we called it uh, in, in the UK. Well, it wasn't the UK in those days, but uh, I mean, Putin gold or Prigozhin gold, I don't know what you want to know, Wagner gold is probably the best uh, best comparison. Yeah, I mean, basically, we don't know, right? I mean, my, my guess is that um, Prigozhin uh, was unhappy, obviously, with the merging of Wagner or dismantling of Mer Mer Wagner and incorporation in the Russian military, he wasn't willing, he wasn't happy with what he was getting was trying it on, had no intentions particularly of taking Moscow and then was just, you know, amazed that by his own success that, you know, and the reality is, you know, there were no Russian forces able really to stop Wagner and his push to, to Moscow, which is extraordinary. Some people have suggested, you know, that this was, this was all a ploy by Putin himself. I, you just can't imagine he would do something that exposed his own absolute weakness. So, you know, I do think it was a, a chance effort by Wagner, you know, fighting within the ranks of, uh, you know, the Putin regime between Wagner and the military, etc. And, and it just got out of hand. And, you know, there was this opportunity presented itself. And in the, in the end, we realised Prigozhin probably could have taken power, didn't have the balls to do that. But it, in the end, it's, it just exposed Putin's ultimate weakness. And I think one of the challenges for Prigozhin that's been pointed out is that he is considered an outsider, you know, certainly by the army, but also the apparatchiks, Siloviki, he may not necessarily have had the backing of the FSB. Now, 
it'll probably be a long time before we know the true story behind this. Um, but he's re-emerging, isn't he? That threat hasn't gone away. What do you think the impact of that, um, call it sort of, you know, realistic paranoia of a, a mutiny part two, and not even by Prigozhin, you know, he may have put that idea into other people's heads now. It's just extraordinary from so many different levels. I mean, the fact that Putin was saved by Lukashenko, in, I mean, it's extraordinary that, you know, Putin, Putin rode in to save Lukashenko from the, the democracy protests. Uh, and obviously, the, there is the, the, the obviously Lukashenko and Putin don't get on, right? I mean, uh, Lukashenko thought that Yeltsin gave him the nod for, you know, to be president of this union of Russia and Belarus. And Putin basically went back on that deal. And so there's, there's lots of bad blood. But ultimately, Putin was saved by Lukashenko. Now Lukashenko is har harboring Prigozhin himself. I mean, you know, what one's got to think that, you know, Putin is this mafia style boss. Surely he can't let Prigozhin ultimately get away with this. Uh, so you'd think that someone, what, either Putin or Prigozhin, will ulti ultimately pay with their lives for this action. But, uh, you know, whatever, whatever happens that, that um, you know, ensures Ukraine's victory and its, its uh, battle to defeat, you know, the Russian invasion, not all the better, I think. So coming back to your point, I think, which is an interesting one, which is the second night now of attacks, or maybe even the third night of attacks on Odessa, destruction of grain silos. And we're back to, you know, large scale terror tactics against civilian infrastructure, against economic infrastructure, and to an extent threatening the food supply to the world. Um, this, of course, ticks several boxes of Putin. It distracts attention from the Prigozhin affair, it makes him look at least to a small circle of his Myra's likes as sort of the hard man is back, et cetera. But is it again, quite a short-term strategy because some of that grain that was destroyed or reputedly destroyed um, was supposed to be going to China. Now they can't exactly have been pleased by that. Um, also does threatening shipping and pulling out of the grain deal put Turkey center stage again um, at this issue and the Black Sea area in a new potential confrontation? Well, you're right. I mean, in a way, the, the Black Sea uh, agreement, uh, originally, Moscow was not greatly enthusiastic for it, right? And it was kind of pushed to do it by Turkey. And some members of the Global South obviously worried about the impact of disruption of grain supplies through the Black Sea on global markets for food, right? And um, as you mentioned, it looks like some cargoes that were destined for China were hit. Um, notice, noticeable China yesterday, Xi, President Xi made some very interesting comments, uh, suggesting that calling the Communist Party to uh, assure food supplies, which maybe was a reference to some concern, obviously what's going on in the Black Sea. You would think that the Chinese would, would pressurize Russia ultimately to come to a deal or moderate its actions so they don't have global impact. I mean, I think one interesting angle that I've certainly focused on has been the relationship between Russia and China. And when we've worried about Putin crossing red lines and escalating things like battlefield nuclear weapons, etc., uh, I think the Chinese have always told him, don't do things that Im impact on global markets. Because also, you know, China, I think, is playing this long-term game for hegemony over the US. It likes the status quo. It doesn't like anything that disrupts markets. And, and I think, you know, they, they uh, set limits on Putin in terms of what he could do, you know, you could, if you want to wage a war, carry on, but don't impact global markets. And this does kind of, at the moment, fortunately, it comes at a time when, uh, you know, food prices and, well, grain prices in particular are on a low. Um, so that's one saving grace. But the longer it goes on, obviously, the worse it's going to be for, for the global south. And interestingly, we've got the BRICS summit coming up in South Africa that Putin won't attend. Um, you would hope that some of those BRIC leaders... Uh, that have kind of had their heads in the sand throughout this conflict, particularly Sir Sir Ramaphosa in South Africa, who's hosting it, will make some pretty strident comments and and push Putin to basically back off and allow shipments of grain out of uh, Ukrainian ports. The problem, as you've highlighted, is there's been a lot of grain infrastructure damaged, and Colonel, one of the major Ukrainian uh, corporates that export grain, produce and export grain noted that some of their, that infrastructure will, will, won't will be able to be repaired for around a year. So, I mean, that's that's a real complication for Ukraine in terms of getting product out. Um, but, you know, this, I think possibly also this is, you know, this 
effort. This does show weakness from Putin, both because of the Wagner story, but also from an economics perspective, right? I mean, I think by doing this, he wants to le he wants leverage to negotiate a moderation of sanctions. You know, they've spoken about uh, this um, fertilizer pipeline they want to uh, opening up. You know, he wants, and also more banks lifted uh, from SWIFT. Um, interesting, yesterday, uh, the West sanctioned another five banks, actually. So actually doing the opposite, tightening financial restrictions around Russia. So, you know, I think it reflects weakness. Generally, it reflects weakness of Russia politically, uh, reflecting the value, but also economically, because I think sanctions are working. This oil price cap is having an impact. It's certainly impacting on both fiscal revenues and balance of payments revenues. The ruble's been weakening. Uh, recently. So I think that's probably all part of that as well. Well, let's come back to the economic health uh, of Russia or, or, or the opposite in a minute. But I think the Black Sea issue um, is an interesting one because Putin has also made the threat not only to pull out of the deal, but there's two other sort of interesting stories. One is that he has said that all shipping in the Black Sea uh, will be scrutinized and potentially if they suspect that uh, it was aiding the Ukrainian war effort, and that could include economic as well as potentially military transport, they would they would potentially target it and, and sink it. But that cuts both ways. Um, it means Ukraine could declare uh, an equal strategy and hit not just military shipping, Russian military shipping in the Straits, it could hit uh, Russian civilian uh, vessels as well, uh, you know, carrying economic materials and so on. Um, this seems to be an escalation that could perhaps blow up. And if by, you know, some horrible coincidence, a Turkish ship was hit, we saw Turkey is quite willing to strike back as when it shot down the uh, Russian fighters that strayed into uh, its territory last year. Well, you're right. Interestingly, um, you know, Russia has focused a lot on this grain, saying this grain, um, the, the grain deal wasn't working for, it, for, for Russia itself. Actually, it kind of was. Russia's been doing very well. It's got record exports of grain at the moment. Uh, this, this, this deal is, is not particularly having any negative impact on Russia itself. And by going back on the deal, and as you mentioned, making potentially making the Black Sea an unsafe um, uh, C for you know, trade in general. I mean, you'd think Russia would be one of the big losers there. It's not that Ukraine is, is taking great advantage more broadly in terms of being able to ship products out of its ports because of this deal. It's really very much limited to grain. So, and the Ukrainians have said actually in response that if, if Russia continues to pursue this aggressive stance that they, they would also see an opportunity to hit Russian, Russian vessels more, more generally. And, and then there is the risk of of accidents happening and, and third parties getting uh, impacted. You mentioned Turkey. I think the Russians will be very careful not to do that because that would be a major escalation. And again, Turkey has been a useful conduit for Russia, uh, particularly on you know circumventing sanctions to a degree, giving it access to uh, to markets, uh, you know, and routes for for export and imports. Um, so I think anything that damages that relationship with Turkey ultimately will be bad bad for Russia. So I think they'd want to avoid that. And, you know, it would be a terrible uh, situation to turn the Black Sea into something akin to, um, I mean, I'm sure you recall the um, Iran-Iraq war and where the straits uh, in, in, in the Gulf were, you know, turned into a war zone. I don't know the exact figures, but thousands of tons of uh, merchant shipping were sunk or destroyed. Um, during that conflict, I mean, it's been overshadowed by later conflicts between uh, US and Iraq. Um, but that that would be a terrible scenario for the Black Sea to turn into such a, an active war zone. Yeah, well, obviously, in all the literal states of which uh, at least three are, are existing NATO members. Right. So you know, that would also risk bringing NATO in more generally with the conflict of, with Russia. And I think, you know, Russia is what we've learned so far about Putin through this conflict is that he doesn't want escalation to bring him into di direct conflict with NATO because ultimately he knows that he would lose a conventional uh, war with NATO very quickly. Uh, so, you know, I, I still think he'll tend to avoid that. It's a threat. It's probably uh, a fairly hollow threat, but this is still damaging for Ukraine, right? Ukraine is, is struggling, you know, the, the, the grain deal did allow it to export I think 30 million tons of grain, uh, which was pretty significant, good balance of payments earner. Uh, so, you know, 
I think a resolution is required here. And this shines, uh, to your point uh, a minute ago, this shines an interesting light on the differences between Western and even Chinese economy and the Russian economy. So if she is is fearful of food supply, he must also be fearful uh, of instability in markets, which, you know, uh, interrupt the accumulation of wealth and development of uh, China's middle class. To an extent, his existence, I may be incorrect here, but his existence as a political leader is very much dependent on the sort of wealth and stability of of that uh, fairly substantial middle class uh, within within China. The West, of course, the US especially, we know that political stability is very much connected to the financial economic health of the middle class in the UK as well. But Russia as a, an extraction economy seems to be able to have absolute disdain for the middle and professional classes. Um, and yet, you know, that juggernaut trundles on. It doesn't collapse in the way that other societies would descend into political economic chaos. Well, on Russia specifically, you know, it's uh, the sanctions are having an effect, right? As I mentioned, uh, fiscal balances, fiscal's in deficit. Uh, I think June had a current account uh, deficit for the first time since 2020. That's because of the impacts of the oil price cap. Uh, the ruble's been under recent pressure. Uh, I mean, the you, whether you believe the data or not that's coming out of the Kremlin, I think the hard fact is when, when countries allow currencies to weaken, it shows that they're struggling and having difficulties. But, you know, sanctions regimes can last a long time. You know, Iran, North Korea, Venezuela, you know, they, they learn to, to exist in sanctions and they prioritise spending, particularly on defence spending. But it's not to say that these regimes do very well. You know, economies survive, but uh, it's a pretty grim outlook. And I think Russia's outlook at the moment certainly is, is not a particularly positive one. And I guess the crunch point comes not so much when it can um, fuel that middle class civil economy. I guess the crunch point is when the regime can no longer afford to pay the army and the security services. Do you foresee a point at which both of these things will uh, come true and generate you know, significant political instability? Well, I think one interesting development this week that maybe suggests that um, you know, the economy is struggling was the decision by the Kremlin essentially to, to take over the, the, the operations of foreign companies in, in Russia, particularly Danone uh, and Carlsberg, and then redistribute them essentially to friends of the regime. I mean, it suggests that Putin is nervous in the aftermath of the Wagner mutiny, uh, mutiny about the loyalty of elites, and he needs to distribute some some patronage and you know assets of Western companies as part of that as that actually to, to win some backing. I mean, it's quite an extraordinary development. Uh, probably more of that is going to happen as as the regime kind of weakens. We've seen that in other jurisdictions that have been sanctioned actually, but. Um, I see that as a sign of weakness. I mean, ultimately, it, it, it will be counterproductive. It will mean that why would any foreign business want to operate in Russia? Why would anyone want to invest in Russia under Putin if your assets are ultimately under threat? So whether you're a Chinese company, an Indian company, or a you know, US multilateral, I mean, I think you'd be very nervous now in, in response to these actions. And uh, that, that suggests that it's not just Wagner Geld, but uh, if he's, you know, burning up uh, whatever assets he can grab to pay people off, that, that's not going to last too long. And, um, you know, if, if the suggested figures are true and you have Sylvie Key that number up to a million uh, at various tiers of the security services and, you know, paramilitary groups that support the Kremlin, that is a lot of pockets to fill, a lot of mouths to feed. Well, absolutely. And just the human cost uh, on, on Russian soldiers, you know, I mean, the numbers, who knows what the actual casualties are. But, you know, if if Western Ukrainian estimates are correct, you know, upwards of 100,000 killed, probably multiples of that injured, you know, many, many Russian soldiers returning home, uh, you know, we, we will have demands for increased benefits because of their war service. Right. So that's a huge drain, uh, likely on the budget, but also. You know, I mean, I guess ultimately these guys will and girls will ask questions, you know, what was it for? Why did we fight? What's the point? What did we gain? Uh, and, and the answer is not very much. Right. So that's ultimately going to create a 
huge social problems in Russia going forward. And likely Putin will have to uh, buy that off somehow uh, by you know, drawing on the budget, um, I don't know, borrowing. It just makes the economic outlook that much more difficult. And is he burning through the patience of his allies as well? We see China uh, not condemning Russia, but certainly um, not really saying an awful lot that is positive. They may well be supplying sort of components and materials, but it seems that they're not supplying, you know, fully manufactured uh, military equipment. Um, there are also rumors that Iran is not particularly happy that it's not received the fighter jets that it's been promised uh, in return for the drones and other materials. And we're now seeing Turkey potentially distancing itself further from this sort of sitting on the fence position. Um, with the acquisition, you know, the 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 uh, the you know, allowing Sweden into NATO and some other recent concessions by Erdogan, um, do you think he senses that the strong man in the Kremlin is 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 actually weak, and is he realigning uh, for strategic interests of Turkey away from Russia? I think that's true. I mean, uh, you mentioned obviously the agreement on Sweden's NATO membership. I always thought that was going to happen. I mean, I thought it was just a big negotiation. He played, Erdogan played perfectly before the elections. He played Swedish, the Swedish Kurdish card brilliantly. But after the election, when he'd won, there wasn't much political mileage to be won uh, by dragging his feet. In, in fact, it, interesting when the, the Turkish economy is in such a difficult place, um, having a crisis with NATO over Swedish succession would probably push the economy over the edge. So I think that was always going to happen, although, you know, obviously Moscow wouldn't have been particularly happy with it. I think the return of Azov commanders uh, to Ukraine was pretty uh, significant. Uh, and also there were various arms deals seemingly negotiated between Turkey and Ukraine over the last couple of weeks related, I think, also to that NATO summit. Uh, and why did Erdogan do it? Well, you're right. I mean, I think in the end he looked at the Wagner mutiny and decided how long is Putin going to be in power ultimately if there's, if there's political instability in Russia you know, where's my bread best buttered, <laughs> for an English expression. Uh, and I think he realised, you know, probably Turkey's place is better in the security of, of NATO. So, you know, he, he definitely sent a signal uh, through the Vilnius summit that he wanted to cement back Turkey's relationship with NATO. And also he reached out to the European Union, you know, suggesting that he wanted to, to, um, uh, to reinvigorate Turkey's EU accession process. Um, that seems unlikely to, to be delivered anytime soon, but I think there is a lot of focus in Turkey about getting a new customs, union, uh, a customs agreement that will be beneficial to Turkey. So I think there was certainly signaling from Ankara that uh, they want to be seen to be more, uh, more clearly in the Western camp and less aligned with Russia if Russia ultimately is going to weaken. And, I, and I said before on China, uh, you know, China uh, clearly backed Putin you know, this, this friendship without boundaries. Um, but it must be questioning the value of this relationship, given the invasion that I don't think China particularly wanted. It's not worked in China's interests. If the continuation of this war and the invasion ultimately leads to the significantly weakening of Russia to the point that you see political, social instability in Russia, China doesn't want that. I mean, China wants uh, wants a stable partner in Russia that is a, uh, that is a assured supplier of commodities to enable its, you know, this economic advancement of China to continue. Uh, it doesn't want something, you know, extreme measures by Putin, which is really what we've seen in the last, you know, two years or actually longer. Uh, rash, rash decisions uh, around the invasion that uh, ultimately... Uh, raise question marks about stability in Russia itself. So I think China would want to calm things down. One hopes that they will encourage Putin to uh, to uh, stop the invasion and, and uh, start peace talks as soon as possible. Um, and interestingly, China has begun to engage a bit more with Ukraine. I mean, China recent last few days actually has spoken about trying to boost trade with Ukraine, which was interesting, I, I thought. Um, uh, so, you know, China also is, seems to be trying to edge its bets a little bit in this one, possibly on the back of uh, perceived Russian weakness. And China, as you say, plays a long game. So they must be looking at a remilitarization 
of uh, European countries, they must be looking at a much higher proportion of our GDP moving forward is going to be going on armaments. It is um, quite unlikely that we'll be buying uh, Chinese armaments. Um, so there's a whole chunk of money that might otherwise in the economy have gone on importing you know, Chinese materials and finished goods, um, which will now actually be going on US and European uh, munitions and armaments. Um, so potentially the outlook of Putin's actions is really detrimental to uh, China's economic interests in the long term. Absolutely. I mean, anything that that um, puts up upside, upside pressure on commodity prices, a commodity importer, that's not good news uh, for, for, for China. A weakening an ally, ally, Russia, through this conflict is not particularly good news for China. Uh, as you mentioned, I mean, uh, one of the results of Putin's invasion, which some argue is because of NATO expansion, I don't agree with that, but uh, uh, actually it's a unified NATO. It's created a stronger NATO. Uh, obviously, Macron argued that NATO was brain dead, actually, <laughs> no, no longer. Uh, there's unity now around spending 2% plus on defence. Uh, I think in terms of military uh, prowess and technology, I think Western military technology has absolutely uh, proven its, its, um, its prowess over, over Russian uh, and, and Chinese, actually, military technology. So, you know, if the Chinese... Uh, and, and I think it's reduced the chances of China actually trying an invasion of Taiwan because I don't think it's Russian orientated military technology would actually win quickly uh, a conflict uh, over Taiwan. So it's reduced, reduced the risks of conflict, I think, in Taiwan. It will make China think twice about its, military, its own military capability against a, a Western armed uh, nation. Um, and overall, I guess it, it's just weakened the, the Russia-China axis overall and strengthened NATO. Now, you've written about uh, Putin's vulnerability potentially hastening uh, an end to the war. And I still, you know, when read quite a few sort of military analysts and uh, those who, you know, class themselves as um, experts in international relations. And they talk about this conflict, you know, going on for years. I've even heard this from some senior sort of military figures. This could last forever because blah, blah, blah. You know, Russia's big and it's strong and it's endless. You, you, you've heard all that kind of stuff, too. Um, if you look at it from an economic lens, however, or a slightly more balanced economic and political lens, and in the light of what's happening with Wagner, the discontent in, in Russian military, the lack of sort of supplies, even in some areas, the inability to feed their own troops, it seems to me highly improbable that Russia could sustain a war um, over years, especially as their capability to uh, inflict force will be diminishing, while the Ukrainian ability uh, with increased weapon supplies and troop training from the West is potentially increasing? Well, I've long argued that, um, you know, this war is disastrous for Russia. I don't see a path to victory. I mean, that's the, 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 the salient point. Uh, and the longer it goes on, the worse it gets for Russia. I, I mean, it's, it's just facts on every count it's been a disaster, you know, from an economics perspective, you know, uh, loss of lots of assets frozen in Western jurisdictions, you know, big hit to growth, uh, huge loss of foreign exchange reserves, outward investment, capital flight, uh, you know, uh, reduced willingness to invest in Russia, which will impact on longer term Russian growth. Uh, politically, I think, uh, as the Wagner uh, mutiny attempt proven, it's weak and Putin domestically. I think it's weakened Putin externally. I mean, I think before the invasion, I think many people in the global south particularly looked up to Putin as this strong man who got his way that everyone had to negotiate with. I think generally Putin is now seen as a bit of a loser, a guy who makes bad decisions for Russia. Uh, and, and diplomatically, uh, and related, actually linked to that, I mean, this going back to the ta Taiwan uh, technology angle, I mean, Russia was seen as a useful alternative supplier of military technology to other countries around the world. You know, Turkey buying S-400s, Egypt, India, etc. in the market for that. I mean, the conflict has shown really that, you know, second generation NATO technology can be fourth generation Russian technology. Um, so Russian arms sales will significantly reduce. And if you're, again, a, a third uh, 
a third um, uh, country who um, you know wants to diversify your 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 you want to be a bit more independent politically geopolitically perhaps from the US uh, but you you need to buy military technology and Russia perhaps provided a an alternative supplier of military technology I think that options kind of been closed now so I think a lot of countries now want will need to uh, you know think about their geostrategic relationships we've seen that actually in the last few weeks both with Turkey and Pakistan right Pakistan's relationship with the West has improved it's, it wants f-16 upgrades similarly does Turkey I mean, one of the reasons why ultimately it did the deal on Sweden Swedish NATO membership is was the Turkish military were desperate to get f-16 upgrades uh, so that pushed that better relationship uh, with, with the West and again move Russia uh, Turkey a little bit out of Russia's orbit so on all angles it's been a disaster and it gets worse it doesn't get any better I don't see how Russia suddenly uh, can um, quickly you know regenerate conventional military capability it's already struggling to get uh, sufficiently motivated and trained troops uh, on the front line in Ukraine and hold the positions it just gets a lot worse and the longer it goes on I think the risk of uh, military collapse in Ukraine increases and perhaps even political collapse in Russia. So I would think Russia and Putin should have an interest uh, this year, I would think, to get its, its allies and friends, China, potentially Turkey, uh, to, to cut some kind of deal. Otherwise, you know, the risk is that th either through the counteroffensive or other actions by the Ukrainians, ultimately they do win in Ukraine. That, of course, presumes that Putin is both a rational actor. I mean, there's still people saying that he is mostly rational, but also assumes that he's getting good information. And I think one of Prigozhin's beefs was that Putin was not getting a realistic impression of the front line. He doesn't look at the internet. He has no direct access to the information sources that you or I might look at. Um, and he's getting little brown folders full of carefully cur curated materials uh, from his his senior generals, Shaigu, Gerasimov, and he's watching, you know, Solovyov's channel, which is pure genocidal BS, frankly, um, not much truth uh, contained in that. So does Putin really understand that he's losing? Well, he's not driving his car around the streets of Kiev, right? I mean, if he was winning, I mean, if, if his initial ambitions were, you know, to take the country in two weeks, I mean, that's certainly not been delivered. Um, he's physically not able to step foot in, in most of Ukraine. His forces, you know, only control something like 15% of the country and have been pushed back. Um, I think, you know, harsh reality will, will should eventually don. And this idea of whether Putin is a rational actor, I do think he is. I mean, I think... Um, you know, time and time again, at the start of this conflict or this invasion, I, I always worried that Putin had escalation dominance and that he cared about Ukraine more than us, right? And, and, and that was his strength and, and that he was willing to go through the gears and do anything to get Ukraine, which I, I also thought initially would possibly mean use of conventional uh, nuclear weapons in Ukraine or weapons of mass destruction. Um, and I, I thought that as we, I think many in the West fear this as well, as we step through the gears in supplying ever more uh, capable military technology to the Ukrainians, that he would do something. He would bomb NATO convoys. He would escalate to stop us doing that. You can think about the sinking of the Moscow. I mean, when I woke up to that news, I thought Putin would do something utterly um, devastating uh, for Ukraine. He didn't do it. And, and I think what we've learned is he doesn't have escalation dominance. Ultimately, he does fear NATO. He doesn't want to get involved in a conventional uh, war with NATO because he, he knows he'll lose in days. And, and the, the, a lot now has been written about, you know, using uh, battlefield nuclear weapons uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and I think the consensus is, and I think the NATO warnings were clear. I mean, if he did that, both he would lose the global south and China, who I think maybe crystal clear don't you do that. But I think NATO also made clear that its response to Russia doing that would be a massive conventional attack by NATO on Russian forces in Ukraine. And I think NATO, given what we now know about the, the disproportionate uh, power or ability of, of NATO kit versus Russian kit, you know, it would be over in, in a very short period of time. Russian forces would be totally wiped out in Ukraine in such a scenario. So, yeah. so I think he is a rational actor. I mean, I, I think he understands that uh, he would lose very, very quickly uh, if if he crossed certain red lines. So he has been constrained both 
I think by his unwillingness to get involved in a conventional war with NATO, uh, but also by what the Chinese say to him. I think that's crucial, isn't it? Without um, Biden and NATO making certain red lines clear in a way that really wasn't made clear or followed up on in, say, Syria and previous incidents, um, he may have felt he could get away with it. And without China, I kind of suspect that after the Kohovka Dam uh, explosion and the eco side, I did feel that, well, if, if, if he's not constrained, if it's not made clear to him that these red lines exist, he would absolutely run through the gears all the way up to, you know, um, instigating a nuclear disaster, etc. So he's entirely capable of doing that. I think there's no moral barrier or check, but it does seem we've been a bit more robust than we have perhaps been in the last two decades, fortunately. Um, however, there are other areas where we are still not pressing on Russia's windpipe. And one of those key ones, uh, extraordinary, ironic, uh, considered the threats to the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, is that Ross Atom is not sanctioned really in any significant way. Why do you think there are these sort of gaps or gray areas in the sanctions regime? Well, you know, sanctions are a complicated uh, business. Um, I guess always with sanctions, the idea is to hurt the target of sanctions more than ourselves. There's always a risk of backdraft, unintended consequences of actions you do. So they need to be very well thought out. And I, I guess with Ross Atom, that's the sense that, you know, if we go down that route, that potentially we, we would create uh, global difficulties. Um, so, you know, I, I tend to think that the sanctions that we have in place are uh, working. They are weakening Russia. Uh, and now sanctions are in place for two reasons. I mean, firstly, they were put in place uh, to push, to encourage Russia to make different choices around Ukraine and certainly uh, stop the invasion. I think now there's an interest of the West, given Putin's aggressive and um, imperialist actions have been proven, uh, and to weaken the Russian conventional military uh, uh, machine and, and his ability to regenerate that. So even if he uh, stops with the invasion of Ukraine, uh, we have an interest to make sure he's not able to regenerate that threat to us. So I think sanctions remain in place for some time. They do have an effect. They grind away. They weaken the com Russian economy over a short period of time. Sure, we can crash the Russian economy you know, in a matter of days if we, if we impose max sanctions. Uh, but again, we, we have to be mindful about the global impact and the impact on global markets, I think. So I think now focus should be in tightening um, the existing sanctions that are in place. Uh, sanctioned uh, countries never stand still. They're always trying to get around the sanctions that are in place. So it's always a work in motion. Uh, I think uh, Western sanctions agencies should, you know, certainly more aggressively use secondary sanctions against uh, companies, banks and countries, uh, 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 third, third party countries and, and, and corporates and banks that are facilitating sanctions evasion. I, I think we can do more there. There's a lot of evidence that the countries around Russia are, are benefiting massively uh, from this uh, uh, sanctions evasion business. Uh, some of it is, is legal business, some of it is it's things like dual use uh, technology that, you know, obviously can be used in washing machines, but it can also be used in fighter jets and missiles. So we need to be tighter there. Uh, but I am confident. I mean, I, I think, again, um, the, the fact the ruble's weakening, the fact that Putin has taken action against these Western companies in Russia uh, and, and the, the numbers themselves do suggest to me that they are having a significant economic impact on Russia uh, and they, they will grind Russia weaker over the longer term. And ultimately, I think that will make Russia make different, different choices. Uh, and another area, I mean, the last area I really want to focus on uh, launches off from that and then into the reconstruction topic. But isn't another area where we haven't really gone all the way is in deciding what to do with the um, seized assets, both of individuals, oligarchs, but also Russian institutions as well. These are sitting in a kind of limbo and in most countries have not been clearly earmarked for Ukrainian reconstruction. I know you take quite a, a bullish point of view on this and perhaps disagree with some of the more timid sort of legal experts. And uh, I think you call them the Humphreys or the apparatchiks in our own finance ministries. What should be done about those assets and how could they be used for Ukraine's benefit? Well, I think that the starting point for our debate around this should be uh, 
how are we going to fund Ukraine's reconstruction? It's, it's a huge task. There was a World Bank report in the first quarter suggested $411 billion of reconstruction needs. Obviously, that increases every day and, and is likely well over $500 billion. Could well be a trillion bucks by the end of the war. Uh, I just don't think there's appetite in uh, amongst Western taxpayers to pay that. We're in a global cost of living crisis. If you think Ukraine's reconstruction is a strategic priority for the West, which I think it is, for two reasons. I think it's important because what's been proven is Ukraine is the front line for NATO. Now we can debate about you know, Ukraine's NATO bid, et cetera, but it's proven that it is the front line in stopping Russian aggression. It's fact. <laughs> Russian tanks, tanks can't drive to Berlin without driving through Kiev first. So we should have an interest in making sure that Ukraine is economically strong and stable and able to sustain its own defense and our own defense. So that's the reason to make sure that Ukraine's reconstruction is successful and speedy. You know, it, we're not talking about this happening over a decade. It needs to happen in a very short period of time because if it doesn't happen, Russia will come back, it will reinvade and it could well be successful. And the second reason is what happens if there's a failure? What happens if we fail to reconstruct Ukraine successfully? Sure, Russian tanks will, will roll back in, but what about political and social stability in Ukraine itself? One million Ukrainian soldiers will return home expecting positive change. If we don't deliver that, there's a massive risk of political and social instability in Ukraine, and it is now the best armed country in Europe. And that is a major danger to us all. And you could see if Ukraine ends up as a failed state, a result of this, you could see huge migrant flows out of Ukraine into the rest of Europe. So we have to get this done. If Western taxpayers are not willing to pay for it, where is the money going to come from? It's a fact. And uh, we had the Ukraine Recovery Conference in London in June, and there was a lot of focus on the private sector. Read my lips. I am in the private sector. The, the private sector will not pay for Ukraine reconstruction if the bill is 500 billion to a trillion dollars. Just not going to happen. Not going to happen for lots of different reasons. One reason is Ukraine will have a debt problem when it comes out of the war. There will be need for debt relief. That will be difficult uh, while the issue of frozen Russian assets is not resolved. Um, private creditors are not going to give debt relief. Uh, uh, when you have to think about who are private creditors, the mostly Western pensioners. Why should they give debt relief to Ukraine? Because our governments are protecting Russian assets in our jurisdictions. Your basic, our governments are basically saying, uh, we value, uh, the, the, we, we, we put a higher store or volume on the property rights of, of Russian oligarchs and the Russian state than our own taxpayers and our own pensioners. Now, I think that's politically explosive, right? So, so to cut a long story short, Ukraine reconstruction should be an absolute strategic priority for us. Uh, I don't think Western taxpayers or private sector creditors, which are pensioners, will pay for it. Where is the money going to come from? Now, we have $400 billion of frozen Russian assets in our jurisdiction, right? And lots of reasons are given why we shouldn't do this, right? One reason is that, you know, if we, if well, around sovereign immunity, that if we do this, uh, other countries that have assets in our jurisdictions, other authoritarian regimes that have assets in our jurisdictions, will pull their money out of our jurisdictions, undermining the dollar or the euro. Total bullshit. Uh, I think the fact that we've immobilized or frozen Russian assets already sends a signal to these authoritarian regimes that maybe their assets are not that safe and they will have already got their money out, frankly. And the second argument is, well, it sends a very strong signal to those countries that, you know, if, if they decide that they would like to invade other countries, commit war crimes and genocide in another country, their assets will be frozen. So maybe they won't do those kind of things. So I think this argument about the, the sovereign immunity and the worry about what third countries might do in response is just, uh, just erroneous and wrong, right? Um, then there is, you know, the rule of law argument that the laws currently don't exist the sovereign immunity argument, uh, but also with respect to oligarch assets, the private private ownership and capital, right? Um, well, laws can be changed. It's a political decision. We saw that recently in Switzerland over the Credit Suisse subordinated debt holders. When needs must, 
and the national security of the country was at stake, laws were changed and they can be changed retrospectively. So, you know, if our governments think that this project is important enough, the laws can absolutely be changed. And there have been some interesting legal arguments uh, made uh, around uh, a temporary suspension of sovereign immunity. There's a, there's a legal argument called uh, countermeasures. And essentially it boils down to the fact when, uh, when a country is behaving in such a terrible way, sovereign immunity can be temporarily waived and you can use that temporary uh, lifting of sovereign immunity to basically uh, seize, well, move from immobilization to seizing to freezing assets and then they use. And I think that's, that's a very credible argument in this case. Bottom line is, I just think some in our governments don't want to do it. They can't be bothered. They don't really understand the strategic necessity. And it's the same people, actually, who, don't, didn't re who mis misread Russia, who didn't really understand the threat from Russia in the, in the first place. And I think they still don't really get it that actually Putin is not just at war with Ukraine, he's at war with us. It's a battle between autocracy and kleptocracy versus Western liberal democracy. And there's an interesting argument that this rule of law arguments made. And uh, I would say if we, if we lose, I, I, I would agree, rule of law is really important in Western liberal market democracies. But if we lose this battle, if Ukraine loses this war, there will be no rule of law to defend in our countries anyway. And the other interesting, a lot of lawyers defend, use the rule of law argument uh, to defend frozen Russian assets in, or immobilized Russian assets in jurisdictions. I, I just question this, this, this sanctity uh, of the rule of law concept in our jurisdictions. Where was the rule of law when we were accepting these assets, particularly from dodgy Russian oligarchs that everyone knew were dodgy? And, you know, we were... <laughs> I mean, I just find it incredible that we, we think that we have this wonderful uh, system of rule of law in our own jurisdictions. What it does is it allows corrupt, uh, corrupt regimes to steal money in their own jurisdictions and then park it in our own jurisdictions using the rule of law as a defense. You know, we, sh we should have asked a lot more questions in the first place of why we were accepting all this money, bottom line. But in the end, look, to cut a long story short again, uh, Ukraine reconstruction will not happen unless we find the cash. Where's the cash going to come from? The only place is frozen Russian assets. That's the harsh reality. So in the UK Treasury and the US Treasury, they just need to wake up. And actually, taxpayers in, a, in our jurisdictions, this should be a scandal. It should be a scandal why our, again, UK Treasury, US Treasury are defending and protecting the, the, the cash of a genocidal fascist regime, which is Russia, and oligarchs that have supported that regime. And, and they prefer to tax our own uh, taxpayers to pay for this reconstruction. I will, uh, I will write that down. I'll get a transcript of this and I'll send it to Ed Lucas and Oliver Bullo, who I'm sure will be delighted <laughs> with that point of view Absolutely. and uh, prepared to, to push it hard as well from their point of view. Um, just the last area really to dig in. Again, it's on the sort of focus of these conferences, which has been on the private sector. But if we look at Ukrainian reconstruction, it can't be done through private economic logic alone because you have to contaminate, uh, decontaminate rather, huge swathes of territory before you can even invest uh, in economic infrastructure, which the private sector would be interested in. And also... If you look geographically, politically, the most important area, surely, is going to be the liberated eastern Donbass. But if you rebuild those areas based on their traditional industries, you're rebuilding back dirty rather than clean and green. Um, and again, can the private sector be expected to foot the bill to build back areas like the Donbass, which using private economic logic may not be viable areas? Um, look, uh, in the end, Ukraine reconstruction is a Western public good. That's reality. You know, our governments want this to happen. The private sector has other objectives and the private sector will be constrained, both, as I mentioned already, by uh, Ukraine's lack of access to markets because of the debt problem. Uh, rule of law related issues before the war, uh, before the invasion, I should say. You know, Ukraine is a difficult place to do business. It was before the invasion. We hope that 
Um, because of the war, things will change, but likely they will be slow to change. So it will continue to be a difficult environment. And there's the whole security issue. And I would argue that unless Western governments give Ukraine proper security guarantees, I would argue NATO membership, I don't think business, international business, will feel secure enough uh, to put large amounts of money into Ukraine. So on lots of different counts, it's just not going to be the private sector. And I just worry that our governments are being disingenuous with us, right? It's they know, they know Western taxpayers won't pay. And it's like, it's like moving the baby, you know, it's holding the baby and moving it to the private sector and dumping the problem on the private sector without really understanding the, the private sector. I mean, I've been to numerous conferences in the last couple of months. Typically, they're all manned by uh, Western government officials, lots of panels filled by Western government officials, all telling us about the private sector doing the Ukraine reconstruction. It, <laughs> they're not the right kind of people. <laughs> Those panels should be filled with private sector representatives telling, them, telling us all about what they think about Ukraine reconstruction. You know, the, the public sector should not be telling the private sector what, what to do in Ukraine. Uh, it's a public good. It needs to be funded publicly. Uh, Western taxpayers, I don't think, will pay for it. The only thing that will pay for it is uh, frozen Russian assets. And of course, if it's done at pace, at speed, which uh, you've said is a political necessity, mistakes will be made, not only in uh, the transparency regime that monitors those investments, but also in planning cities. I mean, surely Ukraine should be thinking how those cities can evolve over the next sort of 100 years or so, uh, rather than being pushed incredibly speedily into, say, rebuilding you know, Soviet grid structures or, uh, you know, uninspiring cities. It, it's a major challenge, isn't it, to both do this and do it creatively and in a way that both aligns with the political necessity, but also with Ukrainian culture and history. Look, I mean, I am optimistic. If, if financing is assured from frozen Russian assets, I think Ukraine has a wonderful opportunity, this, this, I hate slogans, but anyway, people are using it, build back better, right? I mean, it's a huge, it's a wonderful opportunity. And I think, you know, Ukraine, Ukrainians deserve to, to a successful reconstruction uh, because of the innovation bravery they've, they've shown in the war. And I, I do think it's a state of Israel moment, you know, a country that has no option but to change and reform. I, I'd buy all that. Uh, but in the short term, uh, the, the, the initial, uh, financing has to come from the public sector. And again, for, it has to be fro likely frozen Russian assets and we have to do it very, very quickly. So I think Ukraine, uh, you know, if security is assured, hopefully through NATO membership, if the financing is also assured through frozen Russian assets, I think Ukraine has a, a wonderful future. I just worry about Western leadership on all this and the big picture thinking. You know, this project is the most important project in my mind, since the collapse of, of uh, the, the Warsaw Pact in 89 and then the Soviet Union in 91. You know, and we had a, a, a really successful transition from uh, plan to market. If you look at Poland and Czech Republic and Hungary and Slovenia, and Slack, all these countries, that have, it's been utterly remarkable what they've achieved in 30 odd years. Uh, it can also happen in Ukraine, uh, but I just worry that there's very poor coordination there's a real lack of strategic vision, I think, from our, our governments. And I do think there needs to be proper management of the whole process. And I do think there's a need for a, a development agency that is specifically focused on Ukraine. I don't think it's enough that existing um, uh, international development banks like World Bank or EBRD just simply extend their operations uh, to, to a greater focus on Ukraine. I think it, we need a specific Ukrainian entity that its, own, its creation shows the importance of this project. It gives confidence to, to Ukraine itself. It gives confidence to investors that the West's in this for the long term. Uh, and I think it would, would an agency like that would be a powerful driver for, for change in U Ukraine itself. It would be a champion uh, for private business in, in pushing politicians in Ukraine to do the right thing in terms of changing the, 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 rule, the rule of law environment, the business environment, regulatory, all those kind of things in the country. So, but it seems to be falling on deaf ears, ears unfortunately. And I think no one's, there's no leadership, frankly, uh, which is somewhat disappointing. I think we need our, our leaders to be visionary around this and understand the importance of this project. 
you know, I, I, there are a lot of sound bites and uh, a lot of our politicians are very eager to turn up in Kiev for, for kind of photo ops with Zelensky. But I think they don't really understand the real importance of this project. And, you know, long, they don't really have the longer term vision in terms of how to deliver this. And that, that kind of worries me for such an important project. Mm. And it's, it's concerning as well, isn't it? Because a big influence on how this reconstruction is going to be done is whether Ukraine is victorious and takes back all its territories cleanly back to uh, you know the borders uh, in in uh, before 2014 um or whether a deal is cut out of expediency to try and end the war faster leaving chunks of territory in russian hands this could create complications couldn't it for the reconstruction effort and of course for the um getting Ukraine into into the EU and NATO as well. Yeah, uh, I mean, obviously, I mean, I I do think that, you know, what the what the peace looks like is important. The security guarantees are, are really important. Um, you know, I, I think Ukraine can develop successfully if uh, it goes back to the settings February 23rd, 22, definitely. Obviously, the, the, the uh, number one objective is the full liberation of all Ukrainian territory. Uh, but Ukraine has shown a great resilience and resolve and, you know, with, West, with strong Western backing and good coordination. I, I do think that Ukrainians can, can live with, with many difficult scenarios. Uh, and, but, but ultimately, it's really important that this project's successful. Well, Tim, it's been an absolute thrill speaking to you again. I know we've packed in a huge amount of topics here, but I'm kind of hopeful that they sort of flowed one to the other in a, in a logical fashion. Um, and again, I know the audience are going to massively appreciate your insights and the robustness of your vision of what needs to happen because you know the previous two videos went down incredibly well with the audience. Thank you so much for your Excellent. precious time. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye now.